afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this RISE webinar. It is hosted uh, in conjunction with Make You Safe, titled Wearable Tech, Safety Tech, and Workers' Comp Insurers, The Path to Reduce Losses, Expense Reduction, Brand Differentiation, Policyholder Engagement. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, just a little bit of housekeeping, go ahead and you can put those in the Q&A function or in the chat. Um, and a little bit about our speakers before we get started. Uh, Tom West is Vice President at Make You Safe. Tom um, has, as well as being SHRM and HRCI Senior Certified uh, Human Resources Professional. Over the years, Tom has held executive leadership roles and with many companies providing learning and development tools, technology, and services. Tom also served as a college professor for 28 years teaching management, marketing, and small business entrepreneurship. In 2003, he founded Agility Learning Group, which served clients for 14 years. We're also joined today by Chad Beach, uh, who is a Des Moines, Iowa native, uh, started with EMC Insurance in 1997 in the Risk Improvement Department after earning his civil engineering degree at Iowa State University. Now, as Innovation Manager and Assistant Vice President at EMC, he leads a small team that oper operationalizes creative solutions to improve risk for policyholders. He's a certified safety professional, an associate in risk management, and has earned his CPCU. And with that, I will go ahead and turn this over to Tom and Chad. Welcome. Thanks very much, Amy. Appreciate uh, RISE hosting uh, our webinar. And uh, thanks very much to Chad for joining me uh, to talk a little bit about how Make You Safe works and benefits really for insurers, um, work comp and otherwise. Um, we're going to uh, talk about a few things today. In addition to uh, the Make You Safe technology and how our solution works, uh, we can talk a little bit about how machine learning and AI are being used uh, to solve a problem, uh, really, which is identifying high risk uh, and, and hazards within organizations. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, work comp and leading and lagging indicators, some of the characteristics of true leading indicators. And we'll get into some stories, uh, use case stories, of how our technology is being used uh, with uh, EMC policyholders currently. Uh, EMC has been a terrific uh, partner to us uh, and uh, give Chad an opportunity to uh, speak to um, EMC's insurance uh, innovation effort, uh, what his team does, uh, some of the promise that they see in Make You Safe and uh, the experience of, of working with us as a startup uh, thus far over a few years. So uh, with that said, uh, let me first introduce Make You Safe. Uh, we're about a five-year-old startup company, as uh, mentioned. Uh, we're based here in Des Moines, Iowa also, uh, which is uh, also home to EMC insurance companies. Um, and uh, our mission statement is up there on the screen. Uh, we really, we're endeavoring to use technology and data analytics to make uh, industry safer, uh, to protect frontline workers from risks and hazards and make sure uh, everybody goes home safely at the end of each day. Um, at our outset a few years ago, we didn't really realize the implications that that had for workers' compensation insurers, uh, but now we certainly do. Uh, and we're fortunate to be getting uh, significant recognition uh, for which we're very grateful uh, across uh, both the insurance industry as well as um, manufacturing and safety um, uh, areas of focus as well. So uh, with that said, Chad, why don't you join me on screen and uh, if you would uh, talk a little bit about EMC's uh, innovation initiatives and your approach and what your team does and uh, what it's been like to work with us so far. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So 
For, for those of you um, on the webinar don't know, EMC um, has been around for 110 years and we're built on work comp. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, innovation is really in our DNA and always has been. Um, continuous improvement has always been something that we've strived for, uh, something that we do as the risk improvement department, because uh, it's in our name. And, um, you know, we have dedicated a lot of time and resource to innovation because um, it is a differentiator. It will, uh, as, as many companies know, it, it helps those companies to thrive and to grow and to become better. And we've um, established a, a corporate office innovation team that helps coordinate all the innovation activities throughout, throughout all the business units. And risk improvement, uh, which is EMC's loss control function, um, is, uh, is putting a lot of effort, a lot of resource into building, finding, uh, proving out uh, solutions uh, that can help our uh, policyholders uh, reduce risk or improve their risk. So my team uh, deals with a lot of different uh, technologies. Uh, we're doing a lot with IoT, obviously, um, Make You Safe is part of that. We're using drones to capture rooftop imagery, using computer vision on those images to identify roof defects. We have uh, several other applied uh, computer vision and machine learning um, uh, projects going on right now. And we just, we, we use a lot of uh, large data to help our customers identify uh, risk that they have and to determine what controls uh, are reasonable. So, um, you know, the risk improvement department provides a lot of value added services for work comp. Uh, ergonomic assessments, uh, slip, trip and fall prevention assessments, air and noise monitoring, uh, and others, uh, because we know that identifying those hazards and providing solutions uh, will help everybody involved. But when our um, uh, risk professionals are out there, they only see a snapshot in time. So, you know, we can only observe what is there, what exists at, at, at that moment in time where we are assisting on site those policyholders. So we when we became aware of Make You Safe, we realized that this was a, a unique opportunity to give policyholders opportunities to gain insights that they wouldn't have by, by us helping them because you know, um, you know, we're not there all the time. And even a dedicated safety officer at that policyholder, um, you know, they can't be on the floor all the time. They can't see everything. And uh, so you really have, uh, you know, with this Make You Safe system deployed, uh, you have uh, safety professionals gathering data and sending it to you, you know, basically uh, whenever those devices are, are deployed. So, so we believe strongly in it. Um, we're, we've been working with, like Tom said, we've been working with, uh, with them for a while. We've uh, uh, had many strategic investments. Uh, we believe, uh, you know, we're putting our money where our mouths are. Uh, we, we believe in um, what Make You Safe is doing that much. And this year, we're, we're trying to deploy uh, 60 systems to our policyholders for a 12-month no-charge pilot uh, just to gather information, get their feedback about the value of the system, uh, determine, you know, maybe what improvements could be changed and, and, you know, provided to make you safe, and really what kind of uh, benefit it has for not only policyholders, but for EMC, so that there may be an opportunity for us to help, uh, you know, subsidize or cover some of the cost of the system to make it more, even more appealing uh, for those policyholders to take advantage of. So, um, so that's kind of my story, and, and I'll uh, I'll pitch in here whenever uh, Tom uh, needs me to to talk insurance stuff. Um, but I'll give it back to you, Tom. Thanks very much. Yeah, please do uh, feel free to chime in. Um, we're gonna get into uh, what exactly we're doing at Make You Safe and how it works. But let me start off by saying. We've created wearable technology. You may see this armband on my arm here. Uh, I'll hold another a little closer to the camera uh, and we'll come back to this and explain uh, really a lot about what this does. That virtual background probably makes that hard to see uh, at, at moments. But um, let's start first with our general approach. Really the foundational premise upon which uh, our company is built is a belief that in every industrial environment uh, or uh, work site, uh, job site, construction site, there are clues that exist to potential risks and hazards 
that workers face in these environments. And we've created this technology which uses IoT sensors to gather data, which is often referred to as leading indicator data, uh, sometimes called near miss data, good catches, um, all kinds of, of data that has predictive value in understanding where potential hazards and incidents or, or accidents may lie. So in real time, we're able to gather this data and send it to safety management professionals on the front lines within these policyholder organizations, as well as share that with uh, risk improvement or loss control professionals uh, within uh, insurer organizations when there's one involved. And that can help be more predictive, uh, be more proactive uh, with regard to addressing these concerns before incidents occur. Uh, keeping people safe. Let's talk just for a minute about leading versus lagging indicators. If, if you're not a safety person or if you're not in work comp, uh, you may have heard this, but here's a little uh, background for you. Uh, and Chad, feel free to chime in. Traditional approach uh, in safety and probably in work comp as well has been heavy reliance on lagging indicators whether that be um, the EMOD mod score, uh, experience modifier, uh, or you know, notorious in the safety industry is uh, metrics about your total recordable incident rate, which everything is based on. In fact, still to this day, safety leaders and safety departments may be compensated based on keeping that recordable incident rate low. Um, Lock pulling loss run, which is historic, uh, and things like that. There's more emphasis now on leading indicators, certainly in industrial safety. And I think uh, we hear that just about every day from forward thinking insurers, and EMC certainly holds that belief. Uh, here's a couple of, of reference points for you. The National Safety Council defines leading indicators for safety as anything that can be proactive, preventative, predictive measurements of uh, risk uh, so that uh, those potential hazards can be identified and eliminated before people get hurt. Uh, OSHA actually is coming uh, uh, ahead, moving ahead, uh, and now embraces the idea that a good safety and health program should use leading indicators uh, to drive change and lagging indicators only to measure whether or not those things are working. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's some terminology I'll use. And I have seen lately some reference to uh, what the characteristics of meaningful leading indicators are. And I kind of put together this acronym of true leading indicators because I think that's what we provide. Um, I'll describe it here in a little bit further detail in a moment, but these would be you know, data points that are timely, they're relevant, they're immediately useful, actionable, and I think should be easy and economical. Uh, all too often, this discussion about going and mining data involves rooms full of data scientists and building, you know, architecting systems. And it, it just sounds so difficult that it's hard for some businesses to get off the ground. So uh, envision, if you will, that a worker in an industrial operation, a manufacturing facility, or even in you know, logistics, warehouse, pick, pack, ship type operation comes into work at the beginning of their day, beginning of their shift, and walks up to what we call uh, the Make You Safe base station. That's a wall-mounted kiosk. Uh, it houses numerous wearable cores and uh, has a keypad on it. They simply enter uh, their employee ID number or some unique identifier, and one of the bays in this base station will flash green and uh, they simply remove uh, that wearable device and insert it into an armband worn holster. It's now paired with them for the day or for their shift or until they go back to the base station at the end of the day and return it. Uh, and immediately that wearable device now from, from on that connected worker, we say, begins to passively collect data uh, about what they're experiencing and um, 
uh, the conditions that they're operating in. And it sends that data. I'm gonna mute that phone, sorry for that. Just when you think you've thought of everything in preparation for a webinar, very sorry for that. Uh, but as I was saying, now that that device begins passively collecting data from the environment around them and in real time sends notifications back through our base station to what we call our Make You Smart cloud computing platform. And that shows up in uh, our app for safety leaders on any device. It takes about 30 seconds to 40 seconds for that data to get there. Uh, and uh, is, is presented in a way that uh, allows safety leaders to take action to go address things that are happening in the environment, which may cause, uh, present a hazard or cause some risk to be experienced for their workers. So you're probably asking, what kind of data exactly are they collecting? Uh, here is uh, kind of a close up view of the make you safe wearable. And there's numerous IoT and sensors uh, packaged into this very small device. That, that core device is about the size of a matchbox, uh, a little bigger than your thumb, if you will. Um, but I kind of like to talk about this in terms of four general categories or types of data that we're collecting. So first, let's start with data about the environment. Um, some seemingly straightforward things like temperature, uh, humidity, um, light levels. On the other hand, uh, they're very challenging to uh, gather that data in real time and, and make it available and to detect accurately now from on the arm of an individual worker, from on a person. And uh, Chad, maybe you have some comment, but these uh, very, very simple things certainly have a dramatic impact on uh, worker fatigue, on uh, potential for incidents and accidents. Uh, things like uh, heat exposure uh, can cause uh, uh, heat exhaustion and lead to serious incidents. Um, we're also collecting data about uh, air quality on the device. So we can see when there are potential hazards that are detected in the air around a worker. Um, we've got uh, the ability to detect and monitor noise levels. Um, I don't know how many people may be familiar, but um, uh, in accordance with OSHA guidelines, uh, we're monitoring sound in multiple octaves uh, and we're calculating the total time-weighted average of sound dosage for each worker uh, in real time for, for safety leaders. Um, sound exposure can have a dramatic impact uh, and a long lasting life impact on, on workers and can be one of those expensive types of work comp claims. Um, so in addition to environment, we're capturing data about potentially harmful human motion. Um, we're using accelerometers in this small device to monitor motion in three axes or in three different directions, horizontal and vertical and lateral. Uh, and when that motion is coupled with force, in other words, something dramatic beyond normal work happens, we package up a little bit of motion data and we send that to our cloud platform where we're using machine learning and AI, artificial intelligence, to attempt to classify and categorize what type of motion this was. Um, slips and trips and falls constitute something like $20 billion in work comp payouts annually in the US. We're able to determine what was most likely a slip, uh, return that answer with a confidence level, uh, and we can differentiate that from what looked more like a trip instead of a slip. We can see when falls happen. We can see things like bending over in a precarious position and pushing and pulling with a lot of force. Um, those tend to be the kinds of things that lead to uh, ergonomics concerns, uh, strains, overexertion, 
Uh, we can see when motion is repetitive, uh, and a, a, maybe a worker is uh, in the same department with uh, numerous others, but tends to be exhibiting a higher degree of force in, or physicality in doing their work. Um, those are the kinds of things that are helpful in understanding where safety leaders and where loss control professionals want to apply a little bit of um, uh, experience and maybe mitigate risks before people experience injuries and claims. <clears throat> when we're identifying those environmental concerns, things that are outside the norm, or those uh, high force motions, we then identify the location of where these things are occurring. Um, you can think of this as uh, kind of dropping a pin onto a floor plan of a facility. Uh, so we create sort of a heat map. We can begin to see patterns or frequency of indicators by type throughout a job site over time. Uh, we can also do a few other exciting things, which is see uh, wearable to wearable proximity. Um, now, I, I would tell you that a year ago, uh, the term contact tracing wasn't even in our vocabulary, but we swiftly learned uh, how important that was, how challenging uh, managing through COVID was for some of our customers. And we were already gathering some data that could help them understand who's working close to who. Uh, and we're doing some exciting things with wearable to other equipment proximity uh, that may involve or lead to granting or restricting access, um, even speeding up or slowing down a production line based on uh, workers present. So uh, there's all of those things in the last category here would be voice. There's a button in the middle of the device that allows a worker to push it. Uh, it intentionally has to be held down so it doesn't happen by accident, but then they can speak into the device and record up to a 15 second voice memo. And the reason this is important is everybody agrees that getting observations from the frontline workers or getting good catches, they're sometimes re referred to near miss reports, uh, may be the holy grail of keeping people safe. People see things during the course of their work or they experience almost incidents without uh, real things uh, ever occurring. Nobody wants to stop what they're doing, walk over to the next building maybe, and fill out some paperwork to report something that hasn't really happened. And we see workers taking to this voice reporting function uh, very, very easily, sometimes right out of the gates, very, uh, important and significant things get reported from the mundane, like I'm back here in a dark corner of the warehouse and there's a pallet full of material that looks like it might fall over uh, to much more significant things. Um, we had a worker come in early in the morning, uh, first one on, on her department and uh, speak into the device and leave a, a voice memo that said, I think maintenance must have painted our floor last night, but they probably used the wrong paint. It's like an ice rink back here, uh, definite slip and trip hazard. We get um, reports about maintenance issues, uh, reports about um, significant things on a construction site. If you uh, have any experience there, um, you'll, you'll certainly understand how uh, impactful this was, but I think on day one, of, of use of Make You Safe. We had a worker leave a voice memo for their safety leader that sounded like, Bob, you're gonna wanna come out here and see this and I don't think you're gonna like it. And within minutes, the safety leader was able to uh, listen to that voice memo, uh, go out to that specific area of the job site and it resulted in a stop work order. And on a construction site, that's a very, very expensive proposition. Uh, until that situation could be remedied. So that's a little bit about what our device is gathering, what we do. I think in the same breath, it's important to point out what we don't do. Some things I think that, that differentiate us among uh, other uh, wearables in the marketplace. Uh, we're not uh, gathering anything that's personal or biometric or HIPAA covered. Uh, we've got a high degree of concern for worker privacy 
And uh, you may have noticed there are no sensors that are looking inward at the worker. We're not collecting anything uh, about that worker. Instead, the, the device is acting as an advocate for the worker and is looking outward into the environment uh, and uh, understanding what that worker is experiencing while doing their job. Uh, we're not giving any feedback uh, on the device. Uh, we're not setting off any bells or buzzers or whistles, nothing visual or auditory or haptic feedback. Uh, we learned early on that those are the kinds of things that could interrupt work. They could potentially create more of a hazard by startling somebody. And uh, personally, I believe nobody's going to want to wear something if uh, it's constantly going off on their arm and telling them maybe that they're doing something wrong. Uh, we're not continuously tracking workers. Um, we don't care how many times somebody's gone to the restroom today or how long they've been in the break room. If they slipped in there, uh, that would be the kind of, of motion or movement that we would capture, something that's outside of the norm, uh, and we would identify the location of where it's occurring. Um, and a couple of other notes during this you know, challenging time of, of COVID, uh, we're not asking people to use personal devices. All too often we hear about contact tracing and technology and you know the implication is we could do that on a smartphone. Well, in most industrial organizations, uh, it's not uh, permitted to have a, a smart device, a smartphone with uh, the employee on the floor. Might have to be locked in a locker. Uh, and the fact that this is employee, or excuse me, employer-owned equipment, not employee-owned equipment, makes it controllable. Uh, everything gets returned to the base station at the end of the day, so it's sanitizable, uh, except for the armband, which is intended to be consumable uh, and uh, is owned by the employee. Uh, they can be thrown away when they get dirty or nasty. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're not doing. Um, the other half of our solution, if you will, is our software platform. We call that Make You Smart. Um, we're uh, proud uh, of Make You Smart 2.0, the latest iteration of our software platform. Uh, in that, uh, we've endeavored to make the data that is coming through immediately understandable and actionable for safety leaders. Uh, so that they don't have to, you know, interpret it. They don't have to be a data scientist to understand what's going on. Um, on any device, even on a, a smartphone, which uh, leadership is often able to use, or a, a, a tablet computer when walking through their facility, they're able to see the latest indicators that are coming in, uh, motion indicators, environmental indicators, the latest voice memos that haven't been listened to or addressed yet. Um, they can create hazards and tasks uh, so that things that they want to track to remediation uh, are, are now built into the system. Um, we can streamline a lot of reporting and, and compliance paperwork from, you know, first notice type, uh, first notice of incident, first notice of injury, uh, OSHA compliance uh, forms. So that's a little bit about our software platform. And I'll even go a step further and say that we're using um, AI to identify and understand trends and patterns that are occurring throughout a facility and generate opt-in notifications for those leaders who have responsibilities for those areas. Um, we're raising this data to a higher level, if you will, we would call safety and risk intelligence. Um, and, and, you know, the historical way of doing this might have been at the end of the month or the end of the quarter, we're going to spread out all our incident reports and order some donuts or pizza and say, let's look for trends. Now we're able to crunch through millions of data points using the power of cloud computing and uh, generate notifications to uh, trends that are emerging right now, uh, probably in a way that wouldn't before have been humanly possible. Uh, so that's a little bit about our software platform. I'll point out that uh, from the very outset, 
our cloud platform, Make You Smart, was not just designed to take in data from uh, our wearable devices only. Instead, uh, we can also take in other data sources and show that alongside our people data in order to give context to what's happening. So it might be third-party sensors, building sensors, uh, IoT-enabled machinery, um, EMC is working on those kinds of things where they can put sensors on machinery and gather data that may be useful in understanding uh, and predicting where risk occurs. And now with a robust layer of AI and machine learning, we're able to, uh, again, crunch through that data and bring to the surface those things that are, are most significant. So we've got, you know, leadership here in a facility now receiving uh, immediate real-time data about what's happening with their people, uh, where it's happening, uh, and maybe context of what they're working with. Are they permitted to work uh, with the kind of machinery that they're working on? Uh, is this the most productive way uh, to work? And highlighting where those potential risks and hazards uh, are occurring. Uh, recently, we've uh, introduced some technology in our system that we call RangeView. Uh, so we're able to see now not just what's happening around that worker, but also uh, proximity of that worker to others and generate contact tracing reports, for example, or proximity of that worker to other pieces of machinery, other connected factory systems and equipment, uh, and understand uh, uh, from a safety point of view, from a productivity point of view, uh, how we can uh, alert uh, leadership uh, so that they can make adjustments uh, to help achieve their goals. Um, here's one more thing. Uh, good look at what location looks like in our system. Um, it's kind of why I threw that in there. This is a facility floor plan and we begin to see sort of a heat map of things that are occurring. In this case, density of the worker population uh, in these times uh, uh, of managing, you know, trying to stop the spread of contagious disease. Um, that may be useful and illustrative for leadership along with understanding who's worked within six feet of who over the last 48 hours, how many times have they been in contact, what's the aggregate time frame. So with our reporting, we can pull a lot of that kind of data. So with that said, uh, let me uh, point out, um, I guess, the voice memo feature. Uh, one last uh, thing here. If we've got a worker on the front lines who is, you know, pushing the button on their wearable and able to leave us a voice memo about something that they thought was important enough to tell us, um, we get that in the form of a playable audio file as well as a a voice to text translation for safety leaders. Uh, is that the kind of leading indicator data that you think would be useful in reducing losses from both a frontline safety manager point of view, from an organizational point of view, and for insurers being able to provide kind of a, a portfolio look or a book of business look at uh, things that are occurring in each organization and what leadership is, is taking action on um, within uh, that organization to mitigate those risks. So Amy reminded me, my title got a little bit long, but I was trying to cover an awful lot of bases. And uh, Chad, I would invite you uh, really to uh, participate in this conversation. I think these are, these are kind of the four legs of the stool and we really do touch on all of them. Uh, from a work comp insurer's point of view, would you agree? Is the data coming in helpful in understanding risk and reducing those losses proactively before people, you know, get hurt or experience incidents? Yeah, Tom, I, I can say that, I mean, we've, we've been um, working on various IoT initiatives for some time and, and it became uh, very apparent very quickly that uh, you can gain some pretty impressive insights from even just a little bit of data. And we have a, uh, a building and equipment monitoring program where even just temperature and humidity can tell you a lot about what's going on in a facility. So, you know, it's 
there's no difference uh, with Make You Safe as far as that being able to gain tremendous amount of insights. The number of data points that you guys are collecting is extraordinary. So uh, you would definitely expect uh, far more clarity in what is going on. So I think ultimately that uh, that data will help generate signals of something that's going on. So uh, you're not necessarily communicating or identifying exactly what is happening, but that something is happening. We may, we may not know exactly what it is, but it's something worth investigating. And I think that's a challenge that a lot of safety professionals can have is that, uh, you know, maybe they don't even know where to start or what to prioritize, right? And I think, you know, having uh, these signals and the data that say, hey, there's something going on here that could, you know, result in a higher risk of injury to the employee. And I think as you provide that information to somebody who wants to act on it, that is ultimately uh, going to result in them taking actions to implement controls, which will reduce losses. So that, that, I mean, that, and that's what we're all about. That's what we're trying to do. And, um, you know, that's probably the primary reason we're, we're really excited about this product. Uh, I think another thing that um, doesn't impact us directly as much is, I, and I, I don't know if this is what you mean by the expense reduction, but there are tremendous operational benefits, uh, you know, for, you know, beyond just the safety and safety and operation, they really, they really come together and they go together. Um, but there can be tremendous amount of insight that can be gained on in operations and what's going on. Uh, you might have a piece of equipment that's not uh, operating uh, optimally, and that could be reflected in the forces that employee is doing and in interacting with that, that piece of equipment. Um, so, you know, that could be a precursor of that equipment going down and your, your line being out of commission for hours. So that's just a very simple example, but there are all sorts of, I think, operational benefits, business um, benefits, a business case um, that can be made for this beyond even just the risk reduction piece. Uh, the brand differentiation, absolutely. I mean, for, for us, for EMC, certainly one of the reasons is that we, you know, we wanna be uh, the carrier of choice, right? For, for these companies and we wanna attract uh, you know, safety-minded or, you know, risk improvement-minded uh, customers. And, and I think that's, that's what, it, what it's going to do in that engagement. So um, I think you hit all four of those on there, the, the four big ones, like you said, you know, the legs of the stool uh, that, uh, that, that we really think are, is, is going to make uh, this a success for anybody who wants to utilize it. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. I guess just a little give and take um, from my perspective, we've, we've certainly seen those things that are immediately acted on and uh, would have uh, likely resulted in a claim or an incident uh, over the long term. We've heard that from customers. We've heard that when, you know, your loss control team was involved. So that's, you know, an example of using data in order to prevent something uh, right now from happening. Um, you know, actually the historical view we've learned now from customers um, with our, our new reporting functionality, the ability to pull large amounts of data and, uh, you know, slice and dice or sort through it. If we had one claim on the loading dock from somebody who was exerting a high amount of force, right, and sprained a knee or hurt their back or something like that, the ability to go back in time and gather other high force motions that were similar uh, in that worker population so that we can see if other workers are experiencing the same kind of movement and maybe predict something that way has also been useful. And we've heard that, um, you know, from an expense reduction point of view, uh, you and I hadn't really talked about this, but I've heard this recently, especially in light of the fact that, you know, everybody's finding new and creative ways to work. Um, for loss control professionals to get out in the field is a challenge. To have a dashboard in front of them and see, you know, almost like stock market ticker indicators, uh, trends rising or on the decline, uh, might allow them to act more virtually and focus their efforts on those policyholders where things are really happening that they can have a big impact on. Uh, we've heard that as well. From a differentiation point of view, I guess I would say you nailed it. Um, you know, you want to provide value, not just to your policyholders, but you work through a big agent network 
uh, right? So how do we get people to write work comp business review? Having value added tools may help do that and grow top line. Uh, and last, from an engagement point of view, um, you know, we uh, introduced our product uh, or about this time last year, um, right when the, the nationwide lockdown was happening. So it was hard to get out and do some installations. But I think over time, we're seeing that, uh, that engagement, that interaction between the insurer when they're involved and uh, the leadership team within a policyholder organization certainly is good for everybody involved. So that higher level of engagement um, is there. Well, and, and I think I heard this morning, uh, actually, from uh, from one of my team members that uh, you guys got a very lengthy um, bit of feedback on a recent installation, and somebody took the time to provide, you know, I think it was many pages of, of feedback on what they were seeing on, on the dashboard and, and those kind of things. And, and that's incredible. I mean, that's our goal for this is to get as much feedback as possible. And I know, I know you guys love that stuff too. And, uh, and that demonstrates some pretty serious engagement when somebody's able to spend that much time to, uh, to, to offer some valuable feedback. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I don't think we could ask for a better partner. What you're doing for your uh, policyholders and what you're doing to support make you safe and you know help us deploy hardware into the field. Uh, some sometimes uh, with you know subsidizing the cost so that it can be utilized for a year uh, with your policyholders to get that feedback to get the data in the hands of both. Uh, EMC as well as as uh, the safety leadership team on the front lines and see what has value uh, to them. Uh, it's also really meaningful to us. Uh, it helps us get better. So we certainly appreciate the the partnership. And uh, we were kind of touching on several of these things, but here's a, a couple of case studies. Um, Chad was kind of alluding to one of these. This first one on the left. You know, we've actually had workers all wearing the Make You Safe device, all doing the same job at workstations in a row. And several of them won't ever produce a high force motion indicator, but one might, in this case, one did. Uh, and we uh, asked leadership and they said, oh, that's just that guy. His name's Victor, he does things differently. That was, that was it, that was their explanation. Um, we've gone on site and actually asked if we can we see how Victor does his job. What's different about him? And uh, first, he you know stopped and said, "Why is everybody looking at me?" Uh, but then when we explained, uh, I think uh, from a this this was a union workplace as well. This worker was blown away that anybody cared enough to ask what he was doing and how he did it. And uh, when we asked about motion with force. He said, oh, that's easy to explain. I've, I've got kind of a nagging shoulder injury. Um, and at this point, the safety leadership team all kind of raised an eyebrow, like we didn't know that. He didn't tell us. And then we asked, well, how come this high force motion seems to get a little bit more dramatic later in the week? Monday, Tuesday, there's nothing. But then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it seems to increase. And he said, oh, that's easy. I go to the chiropractor on the weekend. And Monday, Tuesday, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's probably starting to bug me a bit. And we walked away from that conversation with the uh, vice president of health and safety saying, we've seen this kind of thing before. That's cost us several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and you probably really helped us dodge a bullet there. Um, so they worked out a program with that worker that kept him happy and reduced the risk for him. Uh, the example in the middle uh, actually uh, was an EMC customer. I hope you don't mind me mentioning, but uh, this was right out of the gates on the first few days. A worker pushed that button and left a voice memo that said, I've been meaning to tell somebody, but this uh, production line has been experiencing, uh, you know, electrical uh, intermittent problems. And uh, it was immediately investigated by leadership and found that there was a short that could have been a hazard to somebody, uh, could have even been a fire hazard to uh, the uh, facility, fire, you know, fire for the, the, the line equipment. And that's a case where uh, I don't know exactly what that claim might have cost if it had eventually occurred, but we were most happy that we 
uh, caught that data and that uh, leadership was paying attention. And I think Ian, she was happy to hear about that too. Uh, and uh, the last example here on the right was uh, just indicative of, of how other data that's gathered might be predictive of risks. In this case, uh, an organization that had a, a pretty good uh, hearing conservation program for their workers uh, and 100% uh, hearing protection mandatory uh, environment uh, was uh, kind of shocked and surprised that a couple of their workers were receiving, you know, 90% or higher of their allowable daily dosage of sound in the first couple of hours of their shift repeatedly. And it was because of the kind of equipment they were doing and the nature of their work. So leadership was able to uh, take some steps to investigate whether or not the hearing protection was adequate for the job that those workers were doing. So that data being delivered to safety leaders uh, so that it has an immediate impact. And you're right, Chad, you kind of mentioned this. We're not telling anybody that this is a priority or this is a, uh, a hazard, but instead we're providing the opportunity for them to prioritize on their own and go investigate, go observe, talk with the employees involved. And when they do that, we then ask, would this likely have resulted in something that would have uh, caused an incident or resulted in a claim? And when we get that answer, that's how we've arrived at, at this, which honestly is a conservative ROI estimate. Um, we're uh, uh, identifying those near misses, those things that would have been likely in the, the traditional average costs of what those claims occur. Uh, or costs when they occur uh, and calculating ROI. If something ever were contested or litigated, it would certainly be much, much higher ROI than that. And part of the reason is our strategic direction has been to keep the cost of using Make You Safe as low as possible. Um, the the, the go-to-market pricing strategy is what you see here on the screen. I'm really sharing that. Um, in an effort to help uh, understand what our approach is. So everything all inclusive is built around a $22 per wearable device per month pricing model. And that includes all the hardware, all the software access and licensing, um, ongoing service and support after installation. Uh, and our team does all of that. And if you think about this, the wearable device might be shared between workers working different shifts. So then that becomes $11 per month per worker. That's kind of on par with uh, what a good set of safety gloves to protect your hands might cost. So we're attempting to keep the cost of our technology as low as possible. And I'll leave you with a couple of uh, things here. And then maybe Amy has gathered some questions uh, in the chat function. Uh, we were fortunate that Gabe, our CEO, was featured on the cover of Smart Manufacturing Magazine recently. And as he points out, uh, connected workers are probably the future of every work site on the planet. We see a lot of evidence um, that there's a lot of demand and acceptance of wearable technology uh, in companies that have a good safety culture where they can build a program around use of wearable technology. It's being uh, accepted and utilized and, and welcomed. Um, and I think the, the impact for safety uh, is, is obvious and evident. And long-term, the impact for uh, improved productivity um, will certainly uh, be proven as well. Uh, connecting worker data with other kinds of data that has an impact for, for our customers. So um, that's it. Amy, any uh, questions that you may have received from the audience? Uh, yep, we've got a few questions here. I'll go ahead and start with this one um, directed at Chad. This um, so have employers expressed any concern about the double-edged sword of the insurance carrier underwriter having access to wearable tech data and the potential impact on premium, uh, for example, in vehicle telematics attached to an auto insurance premium? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, nobody, you know, everybody has a fear of premiums going up. And um, so EMC has no plans whatsoever of using any of this data that's being collected for underwriting or pricing. So uh, when that does come up in our conversations with potential uh, pilot participants, uh, you know, we explain that we're accessing the data to also evaluate this tool for the value that it's going to have for EMC for a potential subsidy of that, uh, that system for them. So, you know, th the premium on the work comp is, uh, is going to be based on the experience like it is now. So, um, so if they use a system like this and they take the insights and they address these risks and they reduce their risks, um, then their experience is going to reflect that. And then actually that their premium is going to go down. So um, I think it's how you look at it. Uh, a lot of that is, um, you know, I think the, the uh, perspective that a safety professional has and, and uh, their interactions with insurers. I would say another thing that has come up um, recently, and in fact, it's it's one where we had somebody who um, uh, who didn't want to go forward with uh, with the system at this point, and that was that uh, they had uh, some concerns that the employees would think that Big Brother, the actual employer, would be you know kind of spying on them or watching their every move, and you know certainly that is uh, a company culture challenge that they have to overcome first. And there are some other things that they're, uh, that they're implementing right now that uh, kind of have the same, you know, data gathering type, uh, uh, type aspect. So, so they're gonna uh, wait on that. But so that, that is definitely is something as we're, you know, crafting our messaging to people who, you know, we're inviting to participate in this, that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not for the big bad uh, carrier to spy on them. Uh, we're actually genuinely trying to help them reduce their risk because it helps them and it helps us. So um, it helps everybody involved and nobody loses. And, and uh, we, we try to get them to realize that. Great question. Yeah, thank yeah, you. I'll, I think you answered that perfectly. I was just going to say, I, I use that analogy of automobile telematics all the time, right? Five years ago, if insurers had told people plug this module in the dash of your car so that we can either drop you or raise your rates, they probably wouldn't have been very successful. And I think we're at the beginning of this journey with wearables for industrial safety, right? It'll take some time, just like it took for automobile telematics to, for insurers to understand the value of the data, maybe build programs or discounts or credit around it um, for their policy orders. Yeah, um, we've got another question here. It says, I'm a loss control specialist at our agency. Um, do I have to install and manage this? Yeah, good question. I'll take that, Chad, and then you can speak to some of the experience maybe. Um, no, you don't have to. Um, our Make You Safe team and our fleet of what we lovingly refer to as Make You Vans uh, hops in uh, our vehicles and we go out after collecting a little bit of, of data information from the, the policyholder, uh, we're able to pre-configure uh, so we can head out and do an installation, which you know, a couple of years ago, we thought was gonna take maybe a day or two. Uh, and now we've gotten that down to uh, less than a couple of hours. That base station hangs on the wall, it needs power and internet, and we preload a roster of who the users are gonna be and who needs access to the software, that kind of thing. So with you know, a couple of 20 minute training sessions, which we try to deliver there. Uh, we tell the users, what is this armband and what does it do? How's it gonna be used? What does it not do? And then for the leadership team, uh, how do they get logged in? What kind of data are they gonna see and how can they begin using it? And usually that's all it takes. So less than a half a day, you're up and running. Um, from an insurer point of view, uh, I think, you know, we're looking forward to streamlining the process so that, you know, EMC, for example, gives us a policyholder that they've identified and talked to and screened up front. Uh, we then have a conversation with them and prepare for that installation. Uh, and both parties have access to the data uh, and begin using it. And we provide that ongoing support after uh, installation so that they can learn more about the system and 
uh, dig into the data a little more detail. Thank you, Tom. Um, got a few more questions here. We'll answer as many as we can. Uh, how do you help employers address privacy concerns expressed by workers? And I think that that's touching on what we were just talking about in the last question. Yeah, um, Chad, maybe you want to comment on this too. I think those privacy concerns might be, uh, certainly they're very real, right? People uh, immediately, when you talk about wearables in the workplace, um, the, even if it isn't spoken, the first thing that people think is, well, all right, how's this going to be used against me? Uh, our best fit is really an organization that has effective leadership, who has built uh, the type of culture where they can uh, uh, announce a program like this and get buy-in from their, from their workers. Um, I don't know that we're able to help in a, in a situation where that, that culture isn't uh, you know, pretty good, pretty decent to begin with. Um, yeah, Chad. Any yeah, but I, so so Tom, I think in one of our early pilot participants, I think we had some of these concerns, or or the uh, the safety officer there expressed that he he thought that it would be a concern with employees. And, and I, if I recall correctly, you guys went in there and sat down with those employees and said, "Okay, this is the device. This is exactly what the data that it collects." And everybody's like, "Oh, okay, yeah, we'll do that." Yeah. So it's um, really, I think it's it's more about understanding really what the technology is and what it really is collecting um, and, and what the you know, employer can know. And then it really it does come down to the, the, the culture of the company and the, the trust that that you know, safety officer, or whoever is managing those uh, safety responsibilities has with those employees. Yep. We've had some upper level managers at policy older organizations ask us, is there anything that's being collected that I wouldn't wanna share with my workers? And that's led us to say, no, not really. I mean, we've just had a conversation with them talking about what was being collected and how it would be used. Um, so uh, we're working on a dashboard now that can be shared like in a, an employee break room up on a big screen. So we can see the kind of data that's coming in. And, and really it's a tool, if you think about it, that's used to hold leadership accountable for addressing risks and hazards uh, not to hold the workers accountable uh, for doing their jobs in any way, shape, or form. So, Excellent points. Thank you. Um, another question here, and we already addressed culture, so maybe um, what other suggestions do you have for employers looking to pilot this type of technology to increase the odds of having a successful implementation? Well, I, I, I Go right ahead, Chad. Oh, I was just going to say. I mean, I think it's. I think it's fairly simple. Um, it, it comes down to engagement. I mean, they they really have to, um, you know, be engaged with what is going on with the data and get out on the floor and find out what's happening. Um, talk with the work. I mean, it it it's really no different than what they should be doing already, except they have more information, they have more data, right? So they. They, they go where they know there are issues, issues that are happening that need to be corrected and have conversations with those employees about how, how do we fix these things. Yeah, I, I would echo the same thing. In addition to culture, really it's a leadership team that has an appetite for or a desire for data, uh, a tool that can help them improve and the ability, the willingness to go out and talk with people about what they're seeing so that they can better understand it. Um, if, you know, a team is overworked and doesn't have time or isn't willing to make time to go have, you know, conversations, these opportunities to discuss things with workers, to, to build that culture and to make sure that everybody understands what they're doing is important, the data is important. Help me make sure that we're doing everything that we can do as a company to keep you safe. Um, if they're not willing to do that, um, then they're kind of sticking their head in the sand and, uh, you know, might not be prudent in the long run. Well, thank you both. Um, I believe that's all the time we've got for today. Um, but if you would like to contact, um, we've got the Make You Safe website up on the screen now, and then you'll be able to view this webinar recorded on our YouTube channel, uh, Rise Professionals. So check us out next time. And uh, thank you, Tom and Chad, again. Thanks, Amy. Thank you.
very much, Amy. And I'll point out, I put a link there to uh, the COVID page on our website. If that is useful, given the time we're all living in, that might be a good thing to check out. And there's a couple of downloadable reports there, which people might find of interest. The importance of near misses, uh, and also a uh, summary of findings from our pilot studies, which were done with EMC. So thanks very much, Chad. Thanks for having us, Amy. All right, thank you.